Chapter 19 of The Professor This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Giessen The Professor by Charlotte Bronte Chapter 19, Part 1 Novelists should never allow themselves to weary of the study of real life. If they observed this duty conscientiously, they would give us fewer pictures checkered with vivid contrasts of light and shade. They would seldom elevate their heroes and heroines to the heights of rapture, still seldomer sink them to the depths of despair. For if we rarely taste the fullness of joy in this life, we yet more rarely savour the acrid bitterness of hopeless anguish, unless indeed we have plunged like beasts into sensual indulgence, abused, strained, stimulated, again overstrained, and at last destroyed our faculties for enjoyment. Then truly we may find ourselves without support, robbed of hope. Our agony is great, and how can it end? We have broken the spring of our powers. Life must be all-suffering, too feeble to conceive faith. Death must be darkness. God, spirits, religion can have no place in our collapsed minds, where linger only hideous and polluting recollections of vice. And time brings us on to the brink of the grave, and dissolution flings us in. A rag eaten through and through with disease, wrung together with pain, stamped into the churchyard sod by the inexorable heel of despair. But the man of regular life and rational mind never despairs. He loses his property. It is a blow. He staggers a moment. Then his energies, roused by the smart, are at work to seek a remedy. Activity soon mitigates regret. Sickness affects him. He takes patience endures what he cannot cure. Acute pain racks him. His writhing limbs know not where to find rest. He leans on hope's anchors. Death takes from him what he loves, roots up and tears violently away the stem round which his affections were twined. A dark, dismal time, a frightful wrench. But some morning religion looks into his desolate house with sunrise, and says that in another world, another life, he shall meet his kindred again. She speaks of that world as a place unsullied by sin, of that life as an era unembittered by suffering. She mightily strengthens her consolation by connecting it with two ideas, which mortals cannot comprehend, but on which they love to repose. Eternity, immortality and the mind of the mourner, being filled with an image, faint yet glorious, of heavenly hills, all light and peace, of a spirit resting there in bliss, of a day when his spirit shall also alight there, free and disembodied, of a reunion perfected by love, purified from fear, he takes courage, goes out to encounter the necessities and discharge the duties of life. And though sadness may never lift her burden from his mind, hope will enable him to support it. Well, and what suggested all this? And what is the inference to be drawn therefrom? What suggested it is the circumstance of my best pupil, my treasure, being snatched from my hands and put away out of my reach. The inference to be drawn from it is that, being a steady, reasonable man, I did not allow the resentment, disappointment, and grief engendered in my mind by this evil chance to grow there to any monstrous size, nor did I allow them to monopolize the whole space of my heart. I pent them, on the contrary, in one straight and secret nook. In the daytime, too, when I was about my duties, I put them on the silent system and it was only after I had closed the door of my chamber at night that I somewhat relaxed my severity towards these morose nurslings, and allowed vent to their language of murmurs. Then, in revenge, they sat on my pillow, haunted my bed, 
and kept me awake with their long midnight cry. A week passed. I had said nothing more to Mademoiselle Reuter. I had been calm in my demeanour to her, though stony cold and hard. When I looked at her, it was with the glance fitting to be bestowed on one who I knew had consulted jealousy as an adviser, and employed treachery as an instrument, the glance of quiet disdain and rooted distrust. On Saturday evening, ere I left the house, I stepped into the salle à manger, where she was sitting alone, and placing myself before her, I asked with the same tranquil tone and manner that I should have used had I put the question for the first time, Mademoiselle, will you have the goodness to give me the address of Francis Evans Henri? A little surprised, but not disconcerted, she smilingly disclaimed any knowledge of that address, adding, Monsieur has perhaps forgotten that I explained all about that circumstance before, a week ago. Mademoiselle, I continued, you would greatly oblige me by directing me to that young person's abode. She seemed somewhat puzzled, and at last, looking up with an admirably counterfeited air of naivete, she demanded, Does monsieur think I am telling an untruth? Still avoiding to give her a direct answer, I said, It is not your intention, then, mademoiselle, to oblige me in this particular. But monsieur, how can I tell you what I do not know? Very well, I understand you perfectly, mademoiselle, and now I have only two or three words to say. This is the last week in July. In another month the vacation will commence. Have the goodness to avail yourself of the leisure it will afford you to look out for another English master. At the close of August I shall be under the necessity of resigning my post in your establishment. I did not wait for her comments on this announcement, but bowed and immediately withdrew. That same evening, soon after dinner, a servant brought me a small packet. It was directed in a hand I knew, but had not hoped so soon to see again. Being in my own apartment and alone, there was nothing to prevent my immediately opening it. It contained four five-franc pieces, and a note in English. Monsieur, I came to Mademoiselle Reuter's house yesterday, at the time when I knew you would be just about finishing your lesson and I asked if I might go into the schoolroom and speak to you. Mademoiselle Reuter came out and said you were already gone. It had not yet struck four, so I thought she must be mistaken, but concluded it would be vain to call another day on the same errand. In one sense a note will do as well. It will wrap up the twenty francs, the price of the lessons I have received from you, and if it will not fully express the thanks I owe you in addition, if it will not bid you good-bye, as I could wish to have done, if it will not tell you, as I long to do, how sorry I am that I shall probably never see you more, why spoken words would hardly be more adequate to the task. Had I seen you, I should probably have stammered out something feeble and unsatisfactory, something belying my feelings rather than explaining them. So it is perhaps as well that I was denied admission to your presence. You often remarked, monsieur, that my devoirs dwelt a great deal on fortitude in bearing grief. You said I introduced that theme too often. I find indeed that it is much easier to write about a severe duty than to perform it, for I am oppressed when I see and feel to what a reverse fate has condemned me. You were kind to me, monsieur, very kind. I am afflicted. I am heartbroken to be quite separated from you. Soon I shall have no friend on earth. But it is useless troubling you with my distresses. What claim have I on your sympathy? None. I will then say no more. Farewell, monsieur. F. E. Henri. I put up the note in my pocket book. I slipped the five franc pieces into my purse. Then I took a turn through my narrow chamber. Mademoiselle Reuter talked about her poverty, said I, and she is poor, yet she pays her debts and more. I have not yet given her a quarter's lessons, and she has sent me a quarter's due. I wonder of what she deprived herself to scrape together the twenty francs. I wonder what sort of a place she has to live in, and what sort of a woman her aunt is, 
and whether she is likely to get employment to supply the place she has lost. No doubt she will have to trudge about long enough from school to school to inquire here and apply there, to be rejected in this place, disappointed in that. Many an evening she'll go to her bed, tired and unsuccessful, and the directress would not let her in to bid me good-bye. I might not have the chance of standing with her for a few minutes at a window in the schoolroom and exchanging some half-dozen of sentences, getting to know where she lived, putting matters in train for having all things arranged to my mind. No address on the note, I continued, drawing it again from the pocket-book and examining it on each side of the two leaves. Women are women, that is certain, and always do business like women. Men mechanically put a date and address to their communications. And these five franc pieces? I hauled them forth from my purse. If she had offered me them herself, instead of tying them up with a thread of green silk, in a kind of Lilliputian packet, I could have thrust them back into her little hand, and shut up the small taper fingers over them, so, and compelled her shame, her pride, her shyness, all to yield to a little bit of determined will. Now where is she? How can I get at her? Opening my chamber door, I walked down into the kitchen. "'Who brought the packet?' I asked of the servant who had delivered it to me. "'Un petit commissionnaire, monsieur.' "'Did he say anything?' "'Rien.' "'And I wended my way up the back stairs, "'wondrously the wiser for my inquiries. "'No matter,' said I to myself as I again closed the door. "'No matter. I'll seek her through Brussels.' "'And I did.' I sought her day by day, whenever I had a moment's leisure, for four weeks. I sought her on Sundays all day long. I sought her on the boulevards, in the Allée Verte, in the park. I sought her in saint Gudule and in Saint-Jacques. I sought her in the two Protestant chapels. I attended these latter at the German, French, and English services, not doubting that I should meet her at one of them. All my researches were absolutely fruitless. My security on the last point was proved by the event to be equally groundless with my other calculations. I stood at the door of each chapel after the service, and waited till every individual had come out, scrutinizing every gown draping a slender form, peering under every bonnet covering a young head. In vain. I saw girlish figures pass me, drawing their black scarfs over their sloping shoulders, but none of them had the exact turn and air of Mademoiselle Henri's. I saw pale and thoughtful faces, encadrées in bands of brown hair, but I never found her forehead, her eyes, her eyebrows. All the features of all the faces I met seemed frittered away, because my eye failed to recognize the peculiarities it was bent upon, an ample space of brow and a large, dark and serious eye, with a fine but decided line of eyebrow traced above. "'She has probably left Brussels, perhaps has gone to England, as she said she would,' muttered I inwardly, as on the afternoon of the fourth Sunday I turned from the door of the Chapel Royal, which the doorkeeper had just closed and locked, and followed in the wake of the last of the congregation, now dispersed and dispersing over the square.' I had soon outwalked the couples of English gentlemen and ladies. Gracious goodness, why don't they dress better? My eye is yet filled with visions of the high-flounced, slovenly and tumbled dresses in costly silk and satin, of the large unbecoming collars in expensive lace, of the ill-cut coats and strangely fashioned pantaloons which every Sunday at the English service filled the choirs of the Chapel Royal and after it, issuing forth into the square, came into disadvantageous contrast with freshly and trimly attired foreign figures hastening to attend Salut at the church of Cobourg. I had passed these pairs of Britons and the groups of pretty British children and the British footmen and waiting maids. I had crossed the Place Royale and got into the Rue Royale. Thence I had diverged into the Rue de Louvain, an old and quiet street. I remember that, feeling a little hungry, 
and not desiring to go back and take my share of the goûter now on the refectory table at Pulley's, to wit pistolet and water, I stepped into a baker's and refreshed myself on a kook. It is a Flemish word, I don't know how to spell it, a corant anglis, a currant bun, and a cup of coffee. And then I strolled on towards the Porte de Louvain. Very soon I was out of the city, and slowly mounting the hill which ascends from the gate. I took my time, for the afternoon, though cloudy, was very sultry, and not a breeze stirred to refresh the atmosphere. No inhabitant of Brussels need wander far to search for solitude. Let him but move half a league from his own city, and he will find her brooding still and blank over the wide fields, so drear though so fertile, spread out treeless and trackless round the capital of Brabant. Having gained the summit of the hill, and having stood and looked long over the cultured but lifeless campaign, I felt a wish to quit the high road which I had hitherto followed, and get in among those tilled grounds, fertile as the beds of a Brobdignagian kitchen garden, spreading far and wide even to the boundaries of the horizon, where from a dusk green distance changed them to a sullen blue, and confused their tints with those of the livid and thunderous-looking sky. Accordingly I turned up a by-path to the right, I had not followed it far, ere it brought me, as I expected, into the fields, amidst which, just before me, stretched a long and lofty white wall, enclosing, as it seemed from the foliage showing above, some thickly planted nursery of yew and cypress, for of that species were the branches resting on the pale parapets, and crowding gloomily about a massive cross, planted doubtless on a central eminence and extending its arms, which seemed of black marble, over the summits of those sinister trees. I approached, wondering to what house this well-protected garden appertained. I turned the angle of the wall, thinking to see some stately residence. I was close upon great iron gates. There was a hut serving for a lodge near, but I had no occasion to apply for the key. The gates were open. I pushed one leaf back, Rain had rusted its hinges, for it groaned dolefully as they revolved. Thick planting embowered the entrance. Passing up the avenue, I saw objects on each hand which, in their own mute language of inscription and sign, explained clearly to what abode I had made my way. This was the house appointed for all living. Crosses, monuments, and garlands of everlastings announced the Protestant cemetery outside the gate of Louvain. The place was large enough to afford half an hour's strolling without the monotony of treading continually the same path, and for those who love to peruse the annals of graveyards, here was variety of inscription enough to occupy the attention for double or treble that space of time. Hither people of many kindreds, tongues, and nations had brought their dead for interment and here on pages of stone, of marble, and of brass, were written names, dates, last tributes of pomp or love, in English, in French, in German, and Latin. Here the Englishman had erected a marble monument over the remains of his Mary Smith, or Jane Brown, and inscribed it only with her name. There the French widower had shaded the grave of his Elmire, or Celestine, with a brilliant thicket of roses, amidst which a little tablet rising bore an equally bright testimony to her countless virtues. Every nation, tribe, and kindred mourned after its own fashion, and how soundless was the mourning of all. My own tread, though slow and upon smooth-rolled paths, seemed to startle because it formed the sole break to a silence otherwise total. Not only the winds, but the very fitful, wandering airs, were that afternoon, as by common consent, all fallen asleep in their various quarters. The north was hushed, the south silent, the east sobbed not, nor did the west whisper. The clouds in heaven were condensed and dull, but apparently quite motionless. Under the trees of this cemetery nestled a warm, breathless gloom, out of which the cypresses stood up straight and mute, 
above which the willows hung low and still, where the flowers as languid as fair waited listless for night dew or thunder shower, where the tombs and those they hid lay impassable to sun or shadow, to rain or drought. Importuned by the sound of my own footsteps, I turned off upon the turf, and slowly advanced to a grove of yews. I saw something stir among the stems. I thought it might be a broken branch swinging. My short-sighted vision had caught no form, only a sense of motion. But the dusky shade passed on, appearing and disappearing at the openings in the avenue. I soon discerned it was a living thing, and a human thing and drawing nearer I perceived it was a woman, pacing slowly to and fro, and evidently deeming herself alone as I had deemed myself alone, and meditating as I had been meditating. Ere long she returned to a seat, which I fancy she had but just quitted, or I should have caught sight of her before. It was in a nook, screened by a clump of trees. There was the white wall before her, and a little stone set up against the wall, and at the foot of the stone was an allotment of turf freshly turned up, a new-made grave. I put on my spectacles, and passed softly close behind her. Glancing at the inscription on the stone, I read, Julienne Henri, died at Brussels, aged sixty, August 10th, 18... Having perused the inscription, I looked down at the form, sitting bent and thoughtful just under my eyes, unconscious of the vicinity of any living thing. It was a slim, youthful figure, in mourning apparel of the plainest black stuff, with a little simple black crepe bonnet. I felt as well as saw who it was, and moving neither hand nor foot, I stood some moments enjoying the security of conviction. I had sought her for a month, and had never discovered one of her traces, never met a hope or seized a chance of encountering her anywhere. I had been forced to loosen my grasp on expectation, and but an hour ago had sunk slackly under the discouraging thought that the current of life and the impulse of destiny had swept her forever from my reach. And behold! while bending suddenly earthward beneath the pressure of despondency, while following with my eyes the track of sorrow on the turf of a graveyard, here was my lost jewel, dropped on the tear-fed herbage, nestling in the messy and mouldy roots of yew-trees. Frances sat very quiet, her elbow on her knee, and her head on her hand. I knew she could retain a thinking attitude a long time without change. At last a tear fell. She had been looking at the name on the stone before her, and her heart had no doubt endured one of those constrictions with which the desolate living, regretting the dead, are at times so sorely oppressed. Many tears rolled down, which she wiped away again and again with her handkerchief. Some distressed sobs escaped her, and then, the paroxysm over, she sat quiet as before. I put my hand gently on her shoulder, no need further to prepare her, for she was neither hysterical nor liable to fainting fits. A sudden push, indeed, might have startled her, but the contact of my quiet touch merely woke attention as I wished. And though she turned quickly, yet so lightning-swift is thought, in some minds especially, I believe the wonder of what, the consciousness of who it was, that thus stole unawares on her solitude, had passed through her brain and flashed into her heart even before she had effected that hasty movement. At least amazement had hardly opened her eyes and raised them to mine, ere recognition informed their irids with the most speaking brightness. Nervous surprise had hardly discomposed her features, ere a sentiment of most vivid joy shone clear and warm on her whole countenance. I had hardly time to observe that she was wasted and pale, ere called to feel a responsive inward pleasure, by the sense of most full and exquisite pleasure glowing in the animated flush, and shining in the expansive light, now diffused over my pupil's face. 
It was the summer sun flashing out after the heavy summer shower. And what fertilizes more rapidly than that beam burning almost like fire in its ardor? End of chapter 19, part 1 Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey.